Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks, where kindred souls gather together to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot, known locally as the February Room, is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite development fly rods and accessories. 40 years of Kiwi ingenuity and graphite technology now available at cd-fishing.us or your local CD USA dealer. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And remember to go fishing. Here's your host, the Carnops, and this is the February Room. As the holiday season approaches, it can mean a lot of time spent with family. But for some, carving out family time is meant to be spent on the water. So I have just the brothers to join me and talk about their time on the water. Welcome to the February Room, John and Eric Nordquist. And it's also my first time having two guests on the podcast. Thanks for taking the time to join me, guys. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, and as I as we were talking before, um, how we've gotten to be in how we got to know each other is because you have gone fishing with Justin, and he has told me that there's two brothers that have some incredible fishing stories, and I can't wait to hear what you guys get to share with me um, on the podcast. Eric, let's start hearing your guys' story. Well, when we um, first started coming back to Montana or whatnot, um, I was inspired by my brother. He, I'm an avid fisherman, but I would consider my brother a rabid fisherman. <laughs> when he sees water, he wants to fish it. It doesn't matter if it's clean, big, small, uh, he wants to fish it. So he talked me into coming back to Montana and he knew of a guy that he had previously. And so we came out and went into uh, Hamilton area and we were setting up for a fishing trip and we wanted to have the same guy because my brother had some really good experiences uh, with this gentleman, his name's Nick. And he was always putting people on fish and, you know, really quality coaching and whatnot. Um, but we couldn't get Nick for two days. And uh, this Nick told us, it's like, well, I have another guy that's really good and he'll help you out. And we said, fine. So um, our first day on the bitter route, we did good with Nick and put us on fish and learned about micro drag and, you know, how to do a little bit more of a reach cast. And, you know, he coached us up really well. Uh, the second day, um, we're waiting for our guide to show up and he let us know he'll be showing up around 930-ish or so. And we were staying at a bed and breakfast and uh, the host offered this guy that kind of tall, lanky, uh, beat up, uh, straw snakeskin hat. And <laughs> he looked like he was in his clothes. He had been in for about a week and <laughs> woke up and it was an invited in for breakfast. And Oh yeah, sure. I'll have breakfast with you folks. And after he finished about six rations of bacon, two helpings of eggs and about four or five biscuits, and we'd been sitting there for about 45 minutes, almost an hour, we were kind of wondering if we were ever going to go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so Scott got us, got us going. We knew he was going to be a guy. This is John. Um, going to be a, a guide for us because when he pulled up, he had a boat that had looked well worn, well used, and we knew he'd been on the water quite a bit. So that was... That was great. And then, you know, just as a parent, you just knew he was on the water. So this is going to be a good day. So again, this Eric now, and we kind of get on the water and he asked us to help him bring the boat across a few places and get it in and do that. It's like, okay, well, it's pretty normal. Cool. And as we're going down the river, he's getting his stuff together, ties us on and doing pretty well. And we maybe had been fishing for about an hour or so. And then, he goes, oh, hang on, guys, and he runs uh, runs the boat to the shore, and he goes, uh, I gotta go out into the woods, and then he runs out into the woods, and we're just <laughs> sitting there, and it's like, where the heck did this guy go? <laughs> and then we're just like, okay, and then he comes running back, and oh, I had to make a pit stop, and then we're fishing down, and he's coaching us a little bit, and um, we happened to notice my brother John was nose gunning, and I was tail gunner, and you know we we're kind of going along and he had this um kind of palmade type stuff on his 
box sitting next to him that was more of a uh, best way to put it is a lube for uh, uh, relationship. <laughs> so he was putting that on the flies to make them stand up a little bit. Uh-huh. I guess maybe the pre runner of Flyagra or something to that. <laughs> so, and then we fished for about a good hour and a half after that. And he said he needed to make another stop. And he's pulling up to the shore. And he pulls up to the shore and gets close. And uh, you hear him say, Oh, crap. And then. He goes, you guys hang on to the boat on the shore. And then he gets out of the boat and he starts running up the shoreline. And then he's kind of steps out in the water, looks a little bit. He yells, I see it. And then he dives head first under the water into the river. (laughs) And we're just still, we just met this guy maybe two, three hours ago. And all of a sudden he comes up uh, with a rope in hand. Oh, I got it. I found it. What he had done is he had lost his anchor. (laughs) Oh, no. So he had, he had not had his uh, back knot on or whatnot. And then that kind of sold us for uh, as a good guide to have because any guy that will go out, runs out of the boat, asks his clients to hang on to the boat for him, and then dives head first into the river to get his anchor. Um, we figured, you know what? He's going to go, if we have a fish on and he needs to go out and go net it, I think he's going to go do that for <laughs> he's us. He's going to go the extra mile. Yeah, so that's uh, that was one of the first introductions to this guy named Scotty, who has uh, been a wonderful guide for both my brother and I, and uh, my son and uh, the family. So it's some great stuff. And then I think John had a story about uh, um, the fly, uh, teaching my son how to tie flies. He was tying uh, elk hair caddis cripples. And then Scotty got a hold of some of those. Right, right. So I was tying supplies at night just because we were doing some of our own walking, waiting days. So Noel and my nephew wanted to learn how. So we started tying supplies one night. And of course, you know, we had to practice quite a few. And the first were were quite, um, I guess, ugly. And so <laughs> we need to work on that. So he'd look and say, well, don't, I'm just going to throw these away. It's like, well, just keep them. They'll, they'll look like cripples. They'll look like, you know some flies that, that aren't going to make it and float on top. The fish are going to want those, so just keep those. So we tied several more flies. We went out the next day, had Scotty look at them. He said, oh, yeah, they may work. And we'll, we'll try those. So we got on the water. We were fishing for a while, caught some fish, had some time to talk, and then he, uh, I think, broke one off. And so um, Scotty tied on and said, hey, give me one of, the, one of your flies that you tied. Let's put that on there and see what it does. So we talked about it looking like a cripple, and it's just not really – well formed and these are just something that the fish are going to want so um scott was reassuring that this it's going to be a good fly so he tied on the fly we we're flowing down the river nolan uh was up front and he was uh fishing down the water he ended up catching um several flies or several fish on that fly that were huge and it was just uh he was just elated with himself because he tied the flies he caught fish on them and they were very nice fish. And I'm still living down the day where um, he tells me about how big a fish he caught as opposed to mine on the flies that he tied. So, Jeez, isn't that crazy? It's like a remix though, right? The story just keeps getting a little bit better each time you kind of keep telling it. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. And he and I joke, um, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna back the, backyard you and I'm going to get bigger fish and my, my worst fly is your best fly. <laughs> so, yeah, it lives on and on and on for sure. We we get better stories every year and how many fish and how big they were. So we gotta get some pictures out to prove it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it, I always like to call it the remix. I'm I'm part of that remix story. I went fishing on the Clark Fork um, with my, or actually this wasn't too long ago because I, as a fellow, I have a twin sister and. You know, I like to say we aren't competitive, but everybody who knows us knows that we are uber competitive. Um, But we went fishing and I think the story, I think really, I think I caught like five fish that day and Claire Mm -hmm. caught three. But as the story has continued, I think I have caught 12 fish that day and Claire (laughs) caught nine. So we keep looking a little bit better. But, you know, I was going to ask you, um, John and Eric, is there, um, and I'll ask this probably for John, is this a, do you guys ever feel like there's a competition when it gets on the water? Like, 
when someone's like, if your brother is catching more fish than you, are you ever like, okay, I need to get a fish. And it's not like it's supposed to be that way, but it does sometimes like gets a little bit more competitive when your other sibling is catching more fish than you. I'll let, yeah, I, I, let John start. I would say that, uh, yeah, it's there because we do, we do start out with sometimes big fish buys the bear, uh, buys the beer or dinner. Yes. Uh, first fish will buy the bigger, you know, things such as whatever, if it's buying dinner or beer. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's a competition where, where, you know, catching the bigger fish or gunning or, you know, Hey, you're, uh, you're getting to fly way too close to me. You need to get it down river or across river. Cause you're you know, <laughs> taking up my water and my space. <laughs> um, so we do have that where, uh, and, and Nolan kind of starts that too, where it's, you know, it's in there where Eric and I have that, uh, you're, you're uh, using up my water, get out of my water cause you're using mine for the fish. So you're trying to catch my fish. So yeah, absolutely. There's, yeah. um, this is Eric. And so there's several conversations. If somebody's nose gunning or tail gunning, um, my preference is to tail gun for some reason, John likes to think that, um, he has for at least uh, 75 degrees from the point of the boat back and it's like no no <laughs> you have maybe like a 30 degree window to nose gun i have all this other there's there's a reason and we we do have these uh kind of a little bit of ribbing or conversations about um hey you know you're uh poaching my area or whatnot and occasionally we we may miss a shot whether either one of us is nose gunning and we will um kind of poach each other's uh, area because dang we know there's a fish in there and we want to get it and we want to get it before the other person has a chance to get it yeah i guess the conversation or some of the comments are if you're not going to fish it i will and if you <laughs> see him not fishing it hey your fly wasn't there uh, hey, I'm sorry, you weren't in the water or yours was going down, so I had to go. There was just no option. You can't leave unfishable water. I'm sorry. It's just, you know, it's kind of a unspoken. And then it's, but it's a good nature, brotherly razzing. And um, absolutely. Yeah, it's with the siblings. And as the story grows, um, you know, occasionally there's some other ribbing that goes on. And, um, John has this occasional when he's trying to get back into a hole real fast. He has this what I call rodeo cast. I swear he's trying to rope the fish and not cast to him. <laughs> it works, like, you know, catch the fish. That's the proof in the pudding. <laughs> that is so true. It reminds me when you were talking about poaching waters. It just reminded me of this story. Justin and I went to Wisconsin to go uh, smallmouth fishing. Uh, and uh, we just found this pocket of water and it was, I mean, there must've been, I don't know, 15 smallmouth. And it was like one after the other of us both just catching fish. It was like, it was my turn. And then it was Justin's mm -hmm. turn. And then all of a sudden um, I had missed my, uh, my hook set. And so Justin's like, okay, my turn to run this water. And I was like, nope. And I took my, I cast it and put my fly right in front of his and then caught the big fish. And um, yeah, I mean, it's like a friendly, like Justin real. was very excited, but I was like, so like, no, no, that was not, that did not count. I still get my opportunity to catch this fish right now. And um, it was such an amazing time on the water, but it's, it's fun when you have those experiences with family, because um, I was just talking to one of my friends, like nobody knows your story better than your siblings right. you know like right. where you came from and um there's something about the reflection of the water also and enjoying that with with your brother or sister or mom and dad yes definitely yeah there's been many a times that we just marvel and you just like you say either tail gunning or sitting up front that you uh we see bald eagles and that's just for us awesome because we don't have as many where we live that we see several when we're up there and then just sitting back and watching the cast watching the take it's just you know often just just as much fun to have and sit and relax and enjoy that beauty and then have the fun with the family sitting there fishing and in that in that nature because there's been many a times where we've thrown flies and yeah like you said uh, that's my turn and we've we've tossed them into each other <laughs> and gotten pretty close, pretty close to each other on the water, and the fish had a hard time choosing which one. Yeah, I, I usually don't wind up the winner. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you guys come to uh, your fishing destinations, do you guys try and uh, coordinate um, like new destinations? Because I know you say that 
trying to find a guide that kind of fits that family bond that becomes kind of part of your family. Your guide really does become part of like the, the memories. Um, are you, is that hard for you both to decide what the next destination is? Or do you guys like to stay in the comfort of like, Hey, we know Scotty and Scotty's our man and we should just stick with that. Uh, well, again, this is Eric. Um, uh, we do try to pick a destination. We understand you can't always get the best guides. And we've had some guides that have been okay and a couple that were mediocre. And then we've had some that are really great. Um, coming back to the Missoula area, we've been fortunate enough to get into some pretty good guides. And then um, if, and Scotty is no longer guiding, but passed us off to um, a gentleman named Jed that was outfitting. And that was kind of the story of how we got um, ran into Scotty and then uh, your husband, Justin, is we were supposed to go through a shop that was in uh, Florence at the time. It was River Otter. And mm-hmm. um, I think uh, the owner was looking to do something else or retire or, you know, and um, hadn't gotten their tags for the rivers. And so that finding the right guide and whatnot was more of, okay, the, there's so much water in this area. We yeah. let's find a new section of water. New water is always okay. But each year it's a different uh, bit of water. So uh, even though you may re- still run that section from, you know, the Darby area down, or if you're running from uh, putting in at the roost down to um, a new bridge, which I think they call Veterans Bridge now, um, you know, it's, it's still, it, each year is different. And I think the guide makes the difference and coming Absolutely. back year after year of having Scotty multiple years and having, see, we would bring three generations back. My, both my parents, uh, our parents would fish with us. Um, and they, they fished with us all the way up into like their late 70s, 78 years old. And they're uh-huh. on the water fishing. Uh, with my brother and I, and also my son who started fishing back there when he was six. So you, Jeez. you create that family history and that family dynamic. And we would sometimes have three boats all together on the water kind of guiding down. And the, the guides were, worked well with each other to let one boat go ahead or hop, skip or leapfrog ahead. And I think it, it is an important piece to find a, uh, an outfitter that will work with you and guides that, that have, they know you a little bit so that, you know, they understand maybe, maybe they remember how you fished the last time or they remember your attitude a little bit. And, but it also builds that comfort and that trust bond with the guide as well as the, the clients that are fishing. I think yeah. the other piece too is it started out um, as a fishing destination to come back with, with, uh, my brother and then it ended up being a family vacation with fishing being the premise and then we just turned it into a vacation family time and going and seeing things in the Missoula area and uh, spending time and then mom and dad would fish with us and my nephew and then we just we bring our families and just stay a week or two and just fish and enjoy it and then um, have the vacation along with the fishing and guys were you know the inside knowledge as far as you know what's around the area was really helpful because <laughs> There were days that we weren't guided, so where can we go fish? Where can we wait? Where can we go do stuff with my nephew, who's six, seven years old? He's not a real big kid, so mm-hmm. we needed some good water for him. And and having that that inside knowledge was really helpful. And then just building the friendships, because there were many times we'd go out afterwards after we've built that friendship and have something to eat or drink uh, in the evenings or see him somewhere else um, on those Saturday uh, markets by the by the uh, river down there, Clark Fork, was awesome too. So. It's, it becomes part of your family tradition. I love that. Yeah, because I think Justin also told me that he said, ask the brothers about the brother-in-law and the broken broken leg or broken arm story. I was like, oh, oh okay. And he's right. like, they've got another really crazy story because it's, like you said, it's a family tradition. So I see that we're now taking brother-in-laws down the river. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> uh one time, a fat, my brother-in-law is a firefighter, so we had this area that uh, we go to down here by the Bishop uh, area for fishing, and it's quite a hike down. So we call it a mini Grand Canyon. It's quite high up. You got to hike down to the river. You kind of scattered out when you're looking up there. 
So one day it's, uh, you got to drive there for a while to get to it. We're scouting it out. We're looking down uh, to where we want to fish. We hike down there. We wait all year because we usually do it on opening of our season or ending. And this happened to be opening in April. And uh, so we're excited. We've been waiting months to go fishing. We get down there. We have our time off. Everybody's scheduled. We start down hiking to the river. We get there. We set up. So first person sets up. Mike's like, okay, I'm in. You guys aren't ready. I'm going to go up there and start fishing. Been there. Ten minutes. He walks up. First hole, four or five casts. Now, nah, I'm going to go up further and wait for you guys, and I'm going to start fishing up. All right. So Mike goes up. Goes to the next hole. Zal and I are standing there tying on our flies, just kind of getting ready, taking it easy. You know, it's relaxing. We hear yelling and screaming, oh, my God, and oh, Jesus, and you know, whatever. So we're looking up. What is going on? I thought we, we were thinking he had a big fish. So we look up, and he's on the ground sitting on his butt, holding his leg. So we're like, oh, okay. Well, here's the drama. All right. So we walk up there. He's holding up his leg. He goes, I think I broke my leg. And he's a firefighter EMT. So he kind of knows what he's talking about. We're like, what do you mean you broke your leg? We've been here like 10 minutes. You're right on the shore. What are you talking about? So then he holds up his leg and his right foot is just flopping right and left. Oh, no. So we're no. like, oh, my God. Oh, Jesus. Look at that. So what do you want us to do? So he goes, all right, get me out of the water. Get me back on shore. So we pull him back out of the water a little bit, get him on shore, prop him up. And, you know, he's in pain. We understand that. We're okay. How can we help? What can we do? Can we, you know, can we stabilize your your foot for you? So he starts rattling off what we, we need to do. I need I need uh, morphine. I need a bag. I need something to secure this. You got to run back up to the car and and get uh, EMS. I was like, okay. Well, I was the logical choice at that moment. I'm not in the best shape, so it is a hike back up there. So hiking back up there, it takes me a good hour to get up to the top oh, no. so he's telling me what to do so i get in the car no service so i gotta drive back to the main 395 still trying to get service drops get service drop i get back to 395 finally get somebody i got one bar calling 911 i get the operator and it's like hi I, got, I had an accident i need some ems i need an ambulance a fire and i need a con crew him being that he does fight fires for a living and he's been down in that area, he knows that the con crew works in that area, which is a conduct crew, and they got their orange vest. They've got the people and police to secure and be around them. So I'm rattling off what I need. And so she goes, hang on a second. Are, are you, are you a, a doctor or a paramedic or something? I said, I'm not, but the guy that's hurt is, and this is what he told me. Um, he needs so I'm supposed to relay this so they bring the right equipment they need a Stokes basket and um, that kind of stuff she goes hang on a second so I'm on hold for a minute or two she comes back on okay we have emergency services is coming your way so we have the highway patrol con crew we're going to get a fire crew out there we're going to get an ambulance and we're going to get um, the ropes okay just wait there we'll come find you and, and we'll get to you all right so I'm waiting and about 10 minutes later highway patrol shows up all right you the person? Yep, I'm the main person who made the call. So, well, okay, we got the services coming, so we're we're going to wait for them and go on up. So they show up, the fire, the crew, the, the local sheriffs, the ambulance. We caravan up. We go out to the place that we're at and park. It's in the dirt. We're looking down. So they get the con crew out. They got to get out, and they said, don't talk to them. You don't say anything to them. You don't look at them. You don't do anything. It's our responsibility. <laughs> okay, great. So they get them out. They face the... They face the the uh, wagon that they came in. We take the EMS and the firefighters and stuff. We go to the edge, look down. Where are you guys at? It's like he's down over there. So they, you know, ask me some questions. Is there any any uh, what do we call it? Any bushes? Anything else as far as a trail? Are we going to need? Anything? He said we need a Stokes basket. We need ropes. We need morphine. We need drip. We need. He starts listing off. Well, it's a good mile down there, so we're we're looking downhill, and it's shale, so it's not an easy trail. It's about 14, 18 inches wide, so it's not really big. So they go back, and they start handing out. They get a, they get a uh, chainsaw, they get the Stokes basket, they get the ropes, they start loading up and carry van on down there. So they start giving the con crew directions as far as clearing a trail, making a path, because they're gonna carry them out there. So we get down to the bottom, Mike's there. He's talking to the EMS firefighters and EMTs. He's telling them what they need. They say, well, I got to see it to know. I just can't take you for your word. So they 
They want to give him the morphine and get him secure. And so they go, we're going to cut off your your shoe and your boot. And he goes, no, no, don't do it. Believe me, I just need it secure because it, it was a high ankle or it's above the ankle where it broke. So it's flopping around. He goes, well, I see it's flopping around, but I got to look. So he takes off the boot, cuts off his waiter boots. And he looks at it and goes, oh yeah, that's broken. So then it starts to swell. <laughs> okay, so he goes, do you want morphine? Yep, I want, you know, morphine. I want it secured. I want it stabilized. Give it to me. So they do all that. So then they break the Stokes basket over. They put him in the Stokes basket, secure him, got him all medicated. He's feeling kind of good. So then we start needing to egress and get out of there. So we need to carry it back up. So there's, I think, eight um, Kong crew individuals that are there. They're going to carry him up. So we gather up all the equipment, get all of our stuff. We start walking up. We get about halfway up, and then we get a call over one of the walkie-talkies. Hold on. We got a rattlesnake. So everybody just stops, kind of looks at each other. Kong crew put Michael down on the ground and he's thinking, oh my God, I am tied down. I can't move. And there's a rattlesnake around there. This is not good. This is not good. So we wait about 10 minutes. Okay. All clear. Rattlesnake's taken care of. Okay, great. So then they pick him back up and they hand him four people up about four or five feet to the next four people. Then they hand the next four people. And so this goes all the way up to the top takes us a good hour, hour and a half to get back towards the car. As we're walking up, we walk by, we see on the rock, there's a rattlesnake that's about four foot long with its head chopped off. So we, we continue on. The captain walks on by and goes, hey, anybody going to take that snake? He's like, uh, no. He goes, okay, I'm going to. So he grabs it. So the fire captain <laughs> takes the snake, carries it back up. He's going to do something with it. When he gets home, I'm sure. So we get back into the get back into the uh, flat area at the top. We talk to him. We get him into the ambulance. Give him some more medication. And tells us where we're going to take him and and uh, to the hospital where we're going to meet him. So I don't know. There's a little more of that where um, his now wife was an EM uh, uh, emergency doctor. So we take him. We get to the hospital. They're evaluating him. They're looking at him. He, they're putting a cast on it. They're going to take X-rays. They're going to do all that great stuff. So we call, or he calls her in the in the back of the uh, ambulance on the way to the fire, on the way to the hospital. Well, they were newly dating at this time, so <laughs> she's thinking because he calls her at, at work at the hospital. And she's thinking, oh, he's missing me so much. Look at that. He's calling. So some of the nurses are, wow, he's calling you already. You've only been going out a couple of months and he's calling you and it's only been a day or two. Well, we ended up calling saying, you know, broke my leg. I'm in the hospital. I'm okay. So, of course, she was very sympathetic. He said, well, I'll come down and pick you up after I get off my shift. So, which was going to be about midnight. So she drove about four, four and a half hours that night and came down and got him and took him home. In the meantime, he said he was hungry. So we went out, had some dinner because Zola and I were starving. So we went out, we had beer and some hamburgers and things like that. In the meantime, Michael's got crutches. He's sitting next to us and basically he ordered a burger and beer, but basically he's not eating. He's just drooling because he's so medicated and he goes, oh, I'll take this with me and then I'll eat it later. We're oh, okay, great. So we get him back in the car, take him back to the hotel, put him in the bed and let him uh, rest while while uh, Aunt Ariana drives back down, and we just waited. So that's like one of the best ways to spend an opening day of your season. Yes, oh, that was a fun story. But they didn't want the rattlesnake as a souvenir. The chief was trying to be like, "This is something that you can remember forever." So, how did he break his his leg? How did that? He just sorry. Fell? I, yeah, I guess I, I missed that. So when we went up to that that second pool, he was standing there fishing. He um, was standing on the bank and it was silty. He just slipped uh, on that. And there was some, the uh, beaver must have eaten some of the willows. So there's uh, the little stubbles were sitting out about four to six inches. He got his w foot wedged in between one of those slips and then twisted and broke his, broke his leg when he slipped into the water and fell down with his foot in, in between those willows. And that's how it ended up breaking. Oh my gosh, that just sounds so painful. And he seems like he was such a good sport. Does he still want to go fishing with you guys? Oh yeah, we go fishing. We go fishing, but uh, he has not lived that down. That that comes up every fishing trip. That he's not going to go first. He's not going to be fishing, and he needs somebody to assist him. Well, just in case. 
He's also the same brother-in-law that's there that he um, first started fly fishing one evening all night long with a straight hook. <laughs> well, I forgot about that one, yeah. So when we first started learning, we were all back, we'd go backpacking for a couple of days to a week. We were, we were lure fishing uh, or lure fishermen. So one, I tried uh, fly fishing. So we went to this lake, had a big outcropping of rocks. So we go out and fish, trying to catch some fish, trying to get, because we went out and when we do these backpacking trips, we, we would try and catch some fish, but we hardly ever catch any. We one time saw this guy was fishing and he was pulling them in right and left. We're like, what is he using? So a couple of us finally went down there and said, what, what lures or what are you using? Because you're catching fish. We're not catching fish. We don't, we don't know what we're doing. Well, I'm fly fishing. I'm using these flies. And it's like fly fishing. So you're using flies that look like bugs? He's like, that's, that's what we do. And it just works so much better. So that's how we started fly fishing. So this one time we were out fishing. And so I was fly fishing and they were lure fishing. And I was catching some fish. They weren't. We went back for dinner, came back after dinner by the campfire, and Michael, the same brother-in-law, went out there, and he was fishing, and we'd hear him out there, and all of a sudden, we were sitting around the fire, five or six of us, and we hear this cussing. It's like, God damn it. Shit. <laughs> Jesus. What the heck? So after about half an hour, 45 minutes of all this cussing and missing fish and whatever else, he came back in. He goes, I was hooking all these fish. I'd find them for a second or two, and then they'd be gone. I don't know what's going on. I can't figure this out. Well, by that time, he came back because it was dark. So the next day, we go down there. It's like, you know, it's in the morning. The fish are kind of active. Go and look at it. We look at the fly. It's like, hey, is this the fly you're using? He goes, yeah. I was like, well, look at it. There's no hook on it. It's a, it's a straight fly. It's it broken off the hook. So he was catching and he couldn't hook them because there was no hook on He's not going to like that story. <laughs> oh, gosh. that's. I mean, I feel like that's something that would happen to me. You know, like sometimes when you put a dropper on right. and all of a sudden you're just like, why am I not like catching any fish? And then you just realize that the dropper is completely tangled. You're like, well, of course, right. the line is awful. Like, why? I need to wear some glasses is actually why I come to the conclusion <laughs> sometimes yeah. where I'm like, oh, I am feeling like I'm getting a little bit older. Like, look at my, my dropper is a mess over there. Um, Eric, I was going to ask you is um, as, as the holidays kind of come up and also if you're like on the boat, um, what recommendations do you have when you start planning these trips with your, um, with your, with your family? I think um, our family has traveled a lot together, uh, lots of different places and overseas. So we, we have a kind of an understanding who takes on or the division of power. Um, if it's John and I that are going somewhere, we kind of say, all right, who's setting up? You set it up. Okay, you make the plans. And then the other person will square up and handle things once we kind of get there. Um, sometimes... Uh, We'll put one person, whoever in the family, if it's going to be more of a family, it's like, okay, mom and dad are retired now, but it's like, all right, mom, you make maybe the house reservations and you kind of do the research there. Either John or I, John, you know, sometimes would handle talking to the outfitters or the guides. And what we learned is, is sometimes once we created that personal relationship, <clears throat> we would talk to, because of some things that happens, you know, over the years and maybe somebody goes out of business or retires or like with COVID or whatnot, mm -hmm. sometimes the guides stay on, but they go to different outfitters. So if you build that relationship and like you do with a brother and the guide becomes kind of like a family or a cousin or, you know, a family member that you go see every so often is then you can give them a call and say, Hey, where do we go? And, what's the best or give us some of those suggestions or what are your thoughts? And it's like when I reached out to Justin recently, it's like, Hey, when, what's the best time of the year or what times do you have or what would be your suggestion? And yeah. it, it, it actually, you go to an eye doctor to get your eyes checked out. You go to your dentist for your teeth, go to the guy that has that local knowledge or the outfitter to hopefully that you have that relationship to get that best piece and um, do your homework, have a plan for what you want to do. If there's say a river that you want to fish or a certain water that you want to fish, but also be open to that guide's knowledge because they're the expert in the field. They're the ones that are spending 60, 80, 100 days on the water. 
And, you know, you, you want to give them that, that due and that credit and, you know, because they're putting in that time. So my suggestion is, is always ask for local knowledge, talk to the guides, get the best information, but then also as family is figure out who's divvying up what and what makes the most sense. And, you know, hopefully people, you understand your family and everybody has their strengths and everybody has their areas that they need to grow with. And hopefully your family member picks up your weak areas and you do the same. And it uh, creates a great trip and great memories. Yeah, having that division of labor really helps. And who's going to set it up? Just have some parameters and talk about it. And just that one person or the other starts to organize that and just makes it easy when you when you do that. It just makes the family time that much better. And John, has there ever been any complications when it comes to like where you guys are going to go or even just planning like the smallest trip sometimes with I'm I'm one of three girls. Mm-hmm. It Sometimes there's just complications in terms of uh, what we want to do. How is that timeline is going to go? Um, is there ways that you navigate the frustrations? Do you just swallow it in and just like just go with the flow? Yeah, I think we. I think at this point we kind of go with the flow. We, we weren't able to come uh, up this summer just because of family and conflicts and coming and going graduations and things like that. So this, mm-hmm. this past season we came up in the fall, which we've never done before. So it was like, hey, it's just not going to happen this summer. Even though we, we made some plans, we made some calls, we talked to some guys, we tried to pick some days. We can do two days, three days here. It really didn't work out this past summer, so we ended up, uh, hey, let's just look at fall. We've never done a fall trip, so let's look at September, October and see what we can do. We look at our schedules for work and the kids and things like that. So, um, yeah, we just kind of, you just, you know, sometimes it's frustrating because you want to go and do it. And, you know, my brother's got, hey, you got three weeks off. I only got like five days during that month. (laughs) So it's like, that's not going to work. All right, well, let's talk about it and maybe revisit next week or something like that. And let's look at some other days. So... We kind of have to keep it open and, you know, we've gotten to that point. But, um, yeah, it can be frustrating at times because you want to or we want to have that family time in those trips. So sometimes it's it's tough to find all that with kids and, and work and, grand, and parents and things like that and grandparents. Yeah, the further you get into life, the more complicated it gets to get other, other people's schedule on the same page. I couldn't agree more with that. Yeah, and the kids are getting independent because they're all in their, you know, well, I guess they're all 20 20s. something now. Yeah, so, you know, time off work, school. I want to go like, so yeah, about uh, two or three years ago, my brother Eric had to take some classes, had to do some stay behind. So we had planned a trip and it's like, I can't do all those days. I can do these days. So mm-hmm. it's like, all right, well, Nolan and I are going to go. And we're going to go there, I don't know, three, four, five days ahead of time. And you show up when you can. You fly up, drive up, whatever you're going to do. We're going to fish. And then I think mom and dad were there. So they came in. They came in later? Yep. So we, um, Nolan, we, so parent, like Eric talked about, my parents rented a house, but they couldn't go at that same time too. So Nolan and I went a few days early. So we drove up there, which was great. That was a great bonding time for, you know, Nolan and I to hang out, talk. What are you going to do at school? How's high school? How's friends? How's girlfriend? You know, yada, yada. I love that. Yeah, which was awesome. And, you know, having a you know 14 hour drive, we, we had some time to talk. So that was great. And I, I let him do most of that, which I was happy about. And he was happy about, too. He enjoyed that time. Because <laughs> he was 16. Yeah, he was 16. <laughs> and he's driving a, a newer car. So anyway, it was it was great. And, and we fished and we, we well, we let's say, put it this way. Those three, four days that we fished so much by the time Eric got there, to fish, Nolan was saying, no, dad, I, I want to take a day or two off. I'm tired. I want to just kind of hang out. But we just, we went fishing every day and we went to many different places. And that was just a great time for, for, you know, uncle and nephew to hang out, have some good fishing time. Parents showed up and we did some things with them and Eric showed up a little later. And that was just, it was awesome. It was a, it was a great time, even though, like you said, all the schedules didn't work out or, or mesh at one time perfectly, but we made it work. I absolutely love that. Is Nolan, um, is he an avid angler now? Does he have the bug? Um, he is. Well, uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> so this is Eric, his, Nolan's dad. Um, <laughs> he started fly fishing when he was about eight and maybe, no, actually seven in all honesty. And being a small, um, wiry kind of kid, pretty light uh, in weight, he, he developed more finesse. Well, my brother is a very, John is an excellent fisherman and he can put the fly almost anywhere he wants. And Nolan 
can compete with him. And uh, you can ask Justin about Nolan and casting. And I uh, think that some pictures you have of my son with your husband. Yes. And it is, um, he's an avid fisherman. It, when kids get in their like late teens, early 20s, maybe they get distracted by work, school, or relationships. But he saw uh, John and I going back to Montana this uh, oh, uh, October, and he just was like, he was not happy. <laughs> he was not pleased <laughs> at all. And well, being the dad and uncle that we are, we were more than joyful to share pictures with him. Of what he was missing. He's so kind, so kind. Yes. We're looking around for his best interest. We wanted to get his social, emotional, <laughs> you know, well-being and hey, this is what you can do too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I absolutely love it. Well, and I think um, I say this a lot. I feel the most time I feel connected is when I'm outside in nature and um, whether it's hunting or fishing, um, maybe even just going for a hike. So I think it's so great that you guys are inspiring as uncles and fathers um, to show that this is something that you can escape to. Yeah, and it's involved in the whole parent, uh, family too. Another story would be that we had, we'd come back to Montana as a whole family, grandparents and parents and and aunts or uh, nieces and nephews. We went out one day, we had a guided day. We had like three days in between and we we're going to have another guiding day. So we asked the guide, Hey, where can we go fishing? So they gave us some great suggestions. They saw, you know, my mom and uh, my mom is fishing. She's new. My nephew, he's young and small. And he, he needs some, you know, support on that. So he gave us some, the guy gave us some um, great advice. So, Eric took my dad and they went to one part of the river. I took my mom and, and Nolan. And I think this was the first time a mom hadn't been fishing. My mom and our mom hadn't been fishing in a long time. So we went up this small creek, hooked everybody up, got their flies on there, gave them a few little casting lessons. Nolan, I think was, that was one of the first times he had gone. We'd gone up this small creek, told him where to cast. He's just casting out there and getting in. Okay, a little more left, a little further up the hole. He ended up catching or getting hooked into a big fish. And so we took, you know, gave him all kinds of directions. My mom was there, his grandmother netted the fish. So got pictures of that. He was, I think that's kind of when he got a fish on and really was able to reel it in and see it. And then having that time with grandma and, and uncle was really excited. And that, that kind of, I think hooked him quite a bit. And then my mom was hooked too. So she was in there and she was next up. So she cast it in and she ended up catching a few fish too. So that was a, a great day on that end for both of them. And that's one of the reasons I think, even though mom and dad, the, the grandparents didn't fish every time, they would go on the fishing trips, fish as much as they wanted to. But part of it was just the experience being with the family being out on the boats and just having a day. And then that kind of hooked Nolan. And since then, when, I don't know, six, seven, eight years old, he's been, he's been very avid about wanting to go fishing. And that's this, Derek, is um, bringing it back to the family in peace. It's like when you're creating these trips to be with family, you're creating memories mm-hmm. and nobody can steal your memories. And it, it, that is the most important piece is being with the family at this time or any other time and making those connections and the indelible memories I have of my mom fishing with my son or watching in a boat a different boat with my my son fishing with his uncle and the coaching and the talking and the family and the camaraderie and just that communication is those are some so precious of memories that I would trade and pay anything for them and um, just seeing that af- over the years through time and then with again your husband and some of the other guides there's such wonderful memories that I totally cherish and, and you know I appreciate the guides taking the time with the family and that's what this is about it's about family and making those connections you know, there's nothing better than uh, your son flying by in a boat with a big fish and a big smallest <laughs> thing. Hey, that's what I got. And the dad going, yeah, that's nice. I like that fish. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's like, a, and when the dad is only catching white fish or maybe a spider. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Yeah, I mean, I bet you I bet you guys have some really good times when it comes to the holiday season, season and you're sitting at the table and kind of going back and remembering things that happened in the past, but then also looking forward to new memories. I remember I had one fishing guide and I cannot remember which one, but um, he said that his job is a memory maker. And I thought 
That is so true because yeah, as a guide, their job is to help you show you where the fish are, but really they are, it, it is a memory day. Like you go out on the, when I, when we went fishing um, in Wisconsin, I remember thinking like today is going to be a good memory. And no matter what it was, whether it was going to be a crazy, like we got skunked all day, no matter what, there's going to be stories that were told on the water. Yes. And um, yeah, I mean, Justin even said like talking with the two of you, you guys seem to have such a great memory stores, stories of books that continue to keep growing bigger and bigger um, <laughs> as you guys continue your journey onto fishing with each other. Absolutely. And then many of those, like you talked about, when we do get together for birthdays or holidays or, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas and sit around the table or sometimes pictures come out and, hey, remember this? Um, yeah. yeah, the story, the stories come back. And, you know, then there's the joking around, like when we were leaving, um, Eric and I had to come up there and, and Nolan couldn't come. Yeah, we were giving him giving bad time and he, he would give it back. I mean, if I was going, I'd be catching <laughs> the biggest fish, you know, well, I cap you and you know, I, I can catch more than you. So, yeah, there were those times throughout our, our, our year and, and days that uh, we remember back the good times and what we did, where we were, and, and the stories and you know some of the experiences because we don't all remember all of them or all of them the same way. So when they do come back up, <laughs> yeah, there's, some, there's some trash talking. Yeah, well, and John, this is the first year you haven't fallen in the river. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Usually I fall in the river, I you know broke a finger one time, and I don't know, something else. But yeah, usually... Uh, those boats are, are treacherous. <laughs> there's there's always someone there to keep you honest, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. Bring them back around, show you where you're at. Mm -hmm. Justin also told me that you guys have um, quite the crazy story being on the Alberton with the with the train wreck that you guys were there. Oh, when yes. That happened. Yeah. yeah on, yes. Now on the Clark Fork. Yeah, we were on yeah. the Clark Fork. Um, uh, we were going down uh, three boats. Yeah. Uh, with a gentleman, one guide was Jed. I think the other was um, Jed Scott, and that guy with the wood boat. Uh, yeah, it was Dustin. Oh, no, we we were with Dustin and and uh, Justin too. Oh, okay. Um, and another more memories and created as as we were going down, we were saw this train on the tracks up above us, and in the morning going by, and they they had the greenish wrap on them or whatnot because they hadn't been painted. On the fuselage, it's, you know. Yeah, it's just the basically the fuselage. And it's like, oh, cool, what's that? And um, I think Jed let us know. It's like, oh, those are, they're shipping them over to Boeing or whatnot. And as one of the river, you know, we were going kind of slow and fishing, and we heard some rumbling up ahead, you know, but nothing, it didn't make it really significant. Um, that was like a loud boom. We weren't that close, but within about 15, 20 minutes, we came around another corner and uh, two or three of them were on the side of the hill and one was all the way down in the river. And it was just like, whoa, that was crazy, crazy just seeing that happen. I'll be there at that time. And yeah, just to being on the river, seeing that, but also, you know, just the, the randomness of it. And um, then you read about it in the paper later, you know, uh, of how significant it was. And yeah, was I think it wasn't that like, didn't it just happen three, was it three years ago? Um, how long ago was did that happen? I think it is between three to five years ago. I'd have to go, go look it up. And that was back in 2014. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I remember when that happened. And uh, it's, I mean, timing is everything, right? To be in the sometimes you're in the right place at the right time to catch the nice fish, but then sometimes you're at the, I mean, wrong place, the wrong time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I can't thank you both enough for joining me today and sharing your stories. And um, the family dynamic is beautiful and convoluted, but it's so great that um, I love hearing when families come together and join on the water because, um, you know, there's obviously been books written about family in water, home waters, uh, river runs through it. And so there's obviously a huge connection when it comes to the water and family. And yes. um, thank you so much for joining me today. Go to the February where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns. And if you have one to spin, shoot us an email at info at the February room .com. The February room is always free, but if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, 
please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February Room, and we'll see you down here next week.